I told you last week we're moving into the practical parts of Romans, right? We, we look, we're, we're looking forward into what uh, we're calling the will of God. And I'm going to tell you folks this morning, Paul is going to get practical with us. He's going to get practical. He's going to hit us with some things uh, that may convict us just a little bit. But he's going to hit us with some commands, with some exhortations that call us to live how Jesus has called us to live. He spent the first 11 chapters laying out this doctrine, this doctrine of grace, this reality that we can be saved by grace through faith. And then in, in chapter 12, the first two verses, he talks about this general will, this general will of God. And he tells us when we look at this general will of God, we should look at it through the lens of mercy. Right? We talked a little bit about our mercies, these mercies of God. Um, and I want to stop right here and just do a couple things. First, got to confess a sin right in front of you all. And second, show you how God reminded me of how mercy can look in our everyday life. Um, this morning, Pastor Brian was driving between Watertown and Waterloo, and Pastor Brian was getting it. All right, we'll just say that. He, he was going. He was going and not really paying too much attention because the clock was getting closer to 830 and Hayden had to be here to work the slides, and I was going, I was moving. But off in the distance, I saw a car, and it was driving, right? But soon that car decided to stop driving and pull over to the shoulder. And it was about that time I realized, oh, that's just not a regular old car, or a car right? That's an old county mountain right there. Dodge County is looking for me. And I looked down, after I had already decelerated to a nice, easy, smooth of mile per hour of 69 miles per hour, speed of 69 miles per hour, you know, 55, okay? It's easy speed, okay. Anyways, he didn't even have to turn his lights on. <laughs> I, I went ahead, and as soon as I passed him, I just offered myself right. I'm right here. You don't even have to come for me. I don't want to hit back your day. Right, and we pulled over, he lights me up. He comes to the window and says, man, where were you going so fast? And I said, well. Go to church, right? <laughs> yeah, I go, pastor, Sunday morning, then to church, nothing like it. And he goes, well, what time are you going to be there? And I said, well, we're shooting to be there at 8.30, but I don't think it's going to happen now. And, uh, and he goes, oh, you're, so you're, yeah, you're running a little bit behind, aren't you? Yeah. I said, how fast were you going? And I said, well, after I saw you, uh, I was doing 69. And he goes, yeah. He goes, the reason I stopped you, well, the reason you stopped before I turned my lights on was because I clocked you a 73 and a 55. And I said, yeah, that's not accurate. <laughs> There's nothing I can do, right? So we have a little bit of small talk that comes with getting pulled over. I give him my license. He says, uh, he takes my license out. We'll run this. He said, well, giving you a warning today would be enough to slow you down. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> right? He goes back and runs. He comes back. It was only a three, four minute interaction. But I take off, and, and uh, when, when I was pulling over, I looked over to Hayden, and I said, Dad's getting a ticket, right? Not Dad's getting pulled over, Dad's getting a ticket. I, I should have got a ticket this morning. But that officer, listen, he had mercy on me. What a, what a clear example of the mercy that he had. I did nothing to deserve it. I did everything to deserve a ticket. And he showed mercy. So what happened is I took off from there. And I use that cruise control function on the truck, right? I did. I use that cruise control. Why? Because in view of the mercy that the cop just had on me, listen, I'm not getting busted again, right? No, nope, I'm going to control myself. I'm going to use that cruise control. So I do that for two reasons, like I said, to confess my sin, but also to say, what a practical way for us to view, literally driving the rest of the way to church in view of that mercy. And see, that's what Paul was trying to paint for us in these first, uh, first two verses of chapter 12, saying, listen, I want you to get this. The will of God's life is for you to live as a living sacrifice, not just for the fun of it, but because of the mercy that God had on you. That's how it actually lands. That how, that's how it impacts us. That's how we really, truly get it. We talked about that last week. We talked about the fact that we are not called to be conformed to the ways of the world. We're not supposed to look like the world. 
But instead, we're called to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, by knowing God's word, by, by living out God's word. And then he gave us some very practical um, examples of gifts that we can use inside the church, that we use as the body of Christ. Remember, we all have individual value, absolutely. But it's also not about you, right? It's about us as the body of Christ to glorify Christ. So then he moves in, and this is where we're going to be today. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12, and we're going to finish the chapter from chapter 9 to 21. And in these 13 verses, 13 verses, he's going to give us 30 commands or exhortations. Or, or he's going to call us in 30 ways how to live the Christian life. He crams a lot in here. There's a lot of good stuff, so we better get going. We'll be here, and you'll have to speak to get to lunch. And <laughs> you may not have the mercy I had. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. God, I'm thankful for your love for us. God, I'm thankful that, uh, that God, you, you can teach us stuff even when we fail. Father, I pray that every single one of us view life in, in the view of your mercy and what you have done for us. And Father, if it takes... An example for us to, to be reminded of that, so be it. Father, I pray that this morning you are glorified. I pray that this morning um, my words would be only what you would have me speak. Father, we thank you, we love you, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this morning, these next 13 verses can all be summed up in one word. We could just go home after it, but I don't think we all get it completely. And that one word is... That one word is love. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because as we walk through this, he does talk about love, that actual word. But there's sometimes he's not actually even talking about love. But if love is the overarching theme in your mind and that's what you're thinking of and that's what comes to mind, you can say, oh, yeah, if I can love, then that takes care of itself. So let's start. He starts in verse 9. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good. Let love. Let's talk about this word love. Because as, as this, these 13 verses can be summed up with love, he's going to start right here with, with a couple interesting facts. So he says, let love. If, any, if there's any Greek scholars in here, you'll know that that love is agape love. That is the love that God has for us. It is an unconditional love. See, I've said this before. Maybe you got tired of hearing it. But we throw love around like it's nothing. Right? I love my wife and I love cheeseburgers. Amen? Right? You no, know, we can't compare those. See, in the Greek, they had four different words for love. They had a love called eros, which is a, a, it's where we get our root word. It's the root word for erotic. It, it is a, a, an intimate love. With someone. It's actually rooted in the, the definition of self gratification. So there's an eros love. We, we've got a, a, a phileo love. We're going to talk about that in a second. It's agape. Or, I'm sorry, phileo is a brotherly love. It's I love you as a brother, phileo. In fact, Philadelphia, you know where that name comes from. It's the city of brotherly love. And we've got agape, unconditional love. Imagine for just a second if God's love to us was conditional. Who in this room could firmly say, I would still be found in the graces of God's love? Any thinkers? Anybody? Because if it was conditional, we failed. If it was conditional, we don't beat the bar. If it was conditional, we are incapable. In fact, he spent the whole Old Testament showing us the law that told us that, right? That was a good reminder that we can't beat that. So God chose out of his love, out of his grace, out of his mercy, to love us unconditionally. What that means is there's never a time, there's no time, there's nothing you can do that God will say, well, you've gone too far, I don't love you anymore. And see, all, up, all, all 11 chapters, all up to this in Romans, Paul has only used the word agape, talking about the love of God to us. This is the first time in the book of Romans that Paul tells us 
that we have to have agape love. That's interesting to me. Because what that does, and what, what I think that does, it tells me that Paul is so sure, Paul is so uh, confident in, Paul wants us to know that that's the, that's the right, that's the true kind of love that God has for us. So when he says, let love be without hypocrisy. This first section of verses, I should have said this earlier, this first section of verses, verses 9 through 13, we're going to deal with a certain kind of love. And that love, it is agape love, but it is a love specifically towards brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a love towards family. Not our blood relatives here on this earth. It's our family in the Lord. So he's telling us, let love, let the way that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, let it be without hypocrisy. Who loves a good hypocrite every once in a while? No, right? No. We don't love hypocrites. Hypocrites get on our nerves, right? But here's the reality. This root, the, the, the root word of hypocrisy, Hippocrates, it, it, here's what it means. Now, they didn't have Hollywood back in the days of Rome, right? They had theater, though. But the theaters were a lot less elaborate. So what the actors would do, and it kind of makes me laugh, and probably think, oh, man, what a horrible story. These actors would actually carry multiple masks in their hands. And they would come out, so just let's think of emojis, because that's popular. Uh, think of uh, an actor coming out and holding up a mask, and it's got a big smiley face. And they say some words, and they're happy. And then this actor drops that, and he holds up the, the shocked face. And now what he says is shocking, or he holds up the sad face. That was the definition of a hypocrite. Someone who is behind a mask, plays a role, and then drops the mask. So it was all, listen... It's all for show. That's what he means by a hypocrite. But he's saying, listen, let love, specifically love to our brothers and sisters, be without hypocrisy. Here's what he's saying. He's saying the church should be filled with love that is not fake. Love that's not fake. Real, true Authentic love, brother to brother, sister to sister, brother to sister, sister to brother. Right? We're God's family. If we say we love God's, or we say we love God, then we're going to love God's children. We should be so confident that in this room, if I walked up and you said, and I said, listen, I want to know, I want you to know that I love you. That it is a it is an unconditional love because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's not a love that I'm putting on the outside saying I love you, but inside I'm like, gosh, I hate this person. It cannot be with hypocrisy. It cannot be with a mask. See, it's easy for us. It's easy, let's go deeper, it's easy for Christians to say, I love you. Why? Because I have to. Because God tells me to. I have to love you. See, that's not the command that Paul's giving us. That's not the exhortation that Paul's giving us. He's saying, listen, we've got to love without hypocrisy. We've got to move on. Detest evil. It's interesting. He just gave us this, this first example of unconditional love that we should have towards someone else. And the next breath, the next ink he pins, hate evil. Detest evil. Some versions say abhor evil. What does that mean? Here's the reality. The character, the nature of God, and who he is. For him to have this, uh, uh, this authentic, this unconditional love. God has, listen, God has hate for sin. Do we hear that? God has hate for evil, for sin. Everything that's not of God, God hates. Now, I know, we grow up, oh, you don't hate anything, right? That's what we tell our kids, you don't want to hate anything. Hate is a word that's thrown around in our culture also. But we have to understand that for this perfect and pure love to exist, there has to be this hate 
that God truly has. In fact, we could go back through Scripture and find examples where sacrifices were given to God. But he knew that they were with hypocrisy. They knew that they were fake, that they weren't genuine, and God said they were detestable to him. So we know that if we bring something to him and it's fake, it's not real, God detests that. Why? Because it's not authentic, it's not good. And anything that's not good, anything that's apart from God is evil, it's sin. So Paul is telling us, listen, while we should cling to this unconditional love for our brothers and sisters, we should hate evil. We should hate evil in a few different ways. We should hate evil in our church. Sure. Um, this is interesting to me. I think one of the biggest weaknesses in our church today, not, not Transformation Church, the church, the American church, the Christian church, listen, I, I think it's tolerance. I think it's tolerance. And it's the tolerance specifically of evil. It's that instead of drawing a hard, firm line on what is good and what is evil, like Paul's telling us to do right here, we kind of let that just get blended. Or if we love the person so much, we'll kind of bend that line for them. We don't want to offend them. We've got this tolerance. Now, why do I say this? Brian, are you just making this up? No. We can look through Scripture. We can look through the first couple chapters of the book of Revelation, in fact, and see that Jesus rebuked the church at Corinth. Why? Because they had a tolerance for immorality. immorality. They tolerated it. We can see that Jesus rebuked the church at Galatia. Why? Because they tolerated legalism. We can see that, they, that, that Jesus rebuked the church at Thyatira. Why? Because they tolerated Jezebel. What a, what a prime example of, of a proof of what Paul's saying here. Listen, we can't tolerate anything that's, that's not of God. And see... Inside this church, it kind of makes sense. We can say, yeah, you know what, you're right. But as soon as we walk out these doors and we say something like that, we're labeled, right? Now we're hateful. Now we don't like people. Now we're too good for people. And it's not true. All we're saying is we're standing on the word of God. We're trying to hold to what Paul's teaching us, what God has taught Paul to teach us. So not only do we love without hypocrisy, we have true, real love. Folks, we should detest evil. We should cling to what is good. Good here, the definition of good. If you look up, if you know anything about looking up like Greek words or Hebrew, I don't know Greek, I don't know Hebrew, um, but I've got some tools that do, and that helps me a lot, right? But they they labeled all these words. So, for example, the Greek word will be G forty nine zero three. And then they'll have a definition. You can find it at places. I, I use an app called Blue Letter Bible. It's interesting to me. I looked up this word good. I want to look at the Greek word good. And it is labeled G18. What does that mean? That means it was one of the first words that was used. In fact, if you look at that, the Hebrew equivalent to that is the same good that when God created this earth, he saw that it was saw that it was good. See, Paul's saying that's what we cling to. I looked up the definition. Good is useful. It's pleasant. Listen to this. It's honorable. See, that's what we cling to. That's what we have to cling to. We, 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 must, we must hate the hardships, the annoyances, the, the, the labors, the things that, that go against God, and, and they, they describe everything that God is not about. That should be something in our life that bugs us. Big time. But we should cling to, we should gravitate to what is good. Folks, we cannot tolerate evil in our own life. Inwardly, with us, our own habits, our own family, our own mouth, our own actions. And folks, we shouldn't tolerate it inside the family of God. Now, what I really love is that Paul didn't just stop this idea right here. Because had this just stopped right here and he went on to another subject, we're going to have a lot of people that are ready to fight people on, on the name of loving good, right, and detesting evil. Now I'm going to hate you because I hate you. But Paul gives us some more instructions. So let's go on. Verse 10. Love 
one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. You ever met someone who's too nice? Come on, you ever, anybody? Ah, oh, who's being so nice? You're too nice. Like you're just outdoing my nice. I'm trying to be nice to you, and you're just nicer. Listen, we are called to show love to our brother and sister. We are called to, and it doesn't just say, I'm glad it doesn't say, show, you know, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters if they also claim the love is good, right? It doesn't say that. It, there's a period, in fact. We are called to love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. See, when we take this theme of love, when we take this idea of love, and we start applying it to all of these verses, when we apply it to um, detesting evil, it changes how we react to that, de the, that detestable evil. So we're called to love one another. We're called to outdo one another in showing honor. We are called to say, you know what, I see your niceness, and I want to raise your niceness, right? I, I want to show you honor. Do what is honorable. Verse 11. Do not lack diligence in zeal. Listen to this. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Now here's what we have. In a good court of law, you got to find out one key thing if someone is on trial, and that is motive. Right? We're going to figure out. Do they have a motive? Does this even make sense? Folks, this is the motive for what Paul is talking about. Specifically, the last three words. Serve the Lord. That's the motive in which we love one another deeply. That's the motive in which we cling to what is good. That's the motive in which we detest evil or we love without hypocrisy. Do not lack diligence in zeal. We are called to be zealous for the gospel. Did you know that? We're called to be zealous. We're called to be all out. We're called to be we're, we're all in. Whichever one, we're going all out. We're all in, right? That's what we're called to be. We're called to be fervent in the spirit. Translated, that means you're supposed to be burning up from within. That's what that means. In fact, you guys remember um, the Emmaus disciples. Jesus was crucified. He was put in the tomb. The disciples were walking back on the road. The resurrected Jesus appears. They go have a meal. Jesus, their, their eyes are opened. Jesus leaves. Do you remember what the first words they said? Did our hearts not burn when he was with us? When we were opening the scriptures. Did our hearts not burn? Folks, maybe we can even relate this to our own life. I know I can. When, when I was 17 years old, I finally heard and really understood the true and, and the, the capacity of the gospel. And I said, God, I'm, I'm yours. I surrender. I'm all in. I surrender my life to King Jesus. I tell people all the time, and this is important, I went down to the altar in front of God on my face and knowing zero Bible verses. I got up from that altar and I had tears in my eyes, but I still do zero Bible verses. Right? I still didn't even own the Bible. I didn't know that there were two testaments. I didn't know there were 66 books. I, I didn't know this stuff. But I can tell you that when I got up, I had this fire within. Maybe you guys can remember this. This fire from when you first surrendered your life to Jesus. When, quite frankly, you wouldn't shut up about Jesus. You know what? They didn't want to hear it. Maybe the next person wanted to hear it. You're just on fire for it. If you've ever served in youth ministry, if you've ever served in a college ministry, you see this. You see this zeal. Why? Because they don't care. They know everything, right? I still live in college. People know everything. But there's this zeal. There's this desire. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, listen, we should, out of the love, or, or for love, for the purpose of love, out of the ability and the willingness and the desire to serve the Lord, we should be zealous for this. We should be burning up. We should be all in for the Lord. I heard a commentator said it's easier to cool down a zealous Christian than it is to warm up a cold corpse. Right? It's easier to take someone who's on fire and just all go, all gas, no brakes, and 
and say, all right, let's tame this, let's do this with tact, let's, let's take that passion and point it in the right direction, than it is for someone who says, I know Jesus Christ, but I don't want to tell nobody about it. I'm good. Paul's saying we should have zeal. We should be excited. We should, out of this burning desire, out of this fire in our heart that's put there by the Holy Spirit, should be serving the Lord. Folks, that's our motive for loving one another. That's our motive for these 30 commands. We should be so fired up because of what the Spirit has put inside of us that we cannot shut up about the King, about King Jesus. Verse 12, rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. It, it, I'm so glad he doesn't say rejoice in results. Amen? Rejoice in results. That would be easy. We can rejoice in results. But he doesn't say that. Rejoice, rejoice in hope. What's hope? Hope's having faith in things that are not seen. Hope's knowing that God is good, knowing that God is working everything for his good, knowing and trusting and believing that even when we can't see it. And folks, we're called to rejoice in that. We're called to be fired up about that, to celebrate that, to thank God for that. Rejoice in hope. Listen to this. Be patient in affliction. Be patient in affliction. Let me tell you what patient doesn't mean. Patient doesn't mean just passive and, all right, Jesus, take the wheel, I'm out. Be patient in affliction means to endure. Faithfully endure, actually. It means that when you're going through affliction, when you're going through things, we don't just like, all right, everything stinks, I'm out, whatever. This wasn't what I thought it was. It means we buckle down a little bit. And we say, you know what, I rejoice when there is hope. I still have hope. I'm going to endure this affliction that I'm going through. I'm going to endure it. That doesn't mean it's going to be fun. That doesn't mean we necessarily even embrace it like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing I've ever done in my life. In fact, Jesus endured the cross. Jesus faithfully endured the cross. We must be patient in affliction. Maybe the key to these two things. Be persistent in prayer. Be persistent in prayer. I don't know if you guys have probably heard it, but it's hard to be mad at someone and praying for you. You've never heard that? Sometimes you have to use it from spouses, right? I'm going to pray for you because I don't want to be mad at you. Go to bed and let's pray together and let's, let's, let's get past this. But there's, there's truth in this. When we lift it up, when we give it over to God, can I tell you something? It helps me rejoice in the hope even when I don't see it. Can I tell you something? When I lift it up in prayer, when I'm persistent in prayer, it helps me be patient in any affliction I'm going through. But God, I've got this hope. God, I trust you. God, if the situation's in your hands, I'm going to continue to faithfully endure this season of life that I'm in or the situation that I'm in, this affliction, this pain, this whatever I'm going through. I'm going to keep my nose down. I'm going to keep focused on you. And folks, I, I, I promise you the very first step, the very first uh, action that you need, the very first one is to be persistent in prayer. To give it to God. To communicate with God. You've heard it before. How, how, how effective would your relationship be with your spouse if you never spoke? That would be tough. That would be tough. Folks, we cannot have a thriving relationship. We cannot be expect ourselves to rejoice in hope. We can't expect ourselves to endure or, or be patient or persistent in affliction if we're not even willing to communicate with the creator. The one who wants the relationship with us. Be persistent in prayer. Verse 13. Share with the saints. Again, he's talking to brothers and sisters. This is the last verse. Share with the saints in their needs, pursuing hospitality. Share in the saints with their needs. Folks, we are a community. Amen? We are a community. I, I'll tell you one thing, and, and not, I, I can firmly say this, not every pastor in this country, state, city, whatever you want to say, can say this. But I am so convinced we have one of, we're in the top 5%, I know that, if I was a mathematician, of being a church who cares about others' needs, about one another's needs. I've seen it. 
You guys, and you maybe don't even know this, you guys have impacted my life in ways that have blown my mind, that have made me pick up a phone and call my friends, right? You're not going to believe this. This is what the church did. This is what people from the church did. This is how we got to serve. Folks, there are churches, there are churches all over that the pastor would be lying if he could sit there and say, yeah, my church cares about my church community. And, and folks, that's one, of the, that's one of the things I love so much about this body of believers, is that we take this to heart, that we understand that we are called to share with the saints in their needs, that we are called to pursue hospitality. We are a family. That's what we do in our family, right? Amen. That's what you guys probably do in your family. You share those needs, your siblings, as much as they can at this young age, right? They share those needs. We pursue hospitality. That's what we're called to do inside the body of believers. That's who we're called to love here in this church. I love brothers and sisters. Now in verse 14, he shifts gears a little bit. And, and we can hear it, in fact. It says, bless those who persecute you. Well, we can tell that I, I think Paul's changed a little bit of topic here because he's talking about family. If we're living out what we see in 9 through 13, we don't need this verse, right? But here's the reality. He now shifts to this idea that we love even in hostility. Even when we've got hostility facing or coming at us, listen, we're still called to love. Love's an action word. Love's a verb. We are still called to do it. Here's what he said. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless and do not curse. Who finds this simple? Now, he's going to get to this here in just a second. Uh, Pastor Skip Heisman, Calvin Chapel guy, says this. He says, persecution is simply the result of the Great Commission. Persecution is simply the result of sharing the gospel, of telling people about Jesus. Listen, here's what this means. You are going to face persecution if you are being faithful to your calling as a believer in Christ Jesus. It's going to happen. Some of us may sit in here and say, you know what, I don't have anyone that persecutes me. This verse doesn't apply. Well, I would check if we're sharing the gospel, right? I would check if we're living that out. Persecution is... Tell me, that's, that is what it is. Listen, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Maybe there's nothing in your life right now that just flashes at you and says, Oh, man, I'm being persecuted. If you are desiring to live a godly life found in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. Maybe it's not right now. Maybe it's not this year. Maybe it's not in response to, you know, we don't know. But if and when that happens... <laughs> Paul shifts here says, listen, those who persecute you, even though you're tempted to go right out, bless them. Bless and do not curse. Wow. <laughs> now we're shifting gears here. This is hard. Here's what I want us to see about these first, uh, the, the verses 9 through 13. Listen, we have got to get that right. We have got to get that right. Here's why, here's why I say that. That's the easy one. That should be the easy one to love brothers and sisters inside the church. And in fact, that's what we have to understand to build on, to face people who are hostile. And then towards the end of the chapter, our enemies. If we don't get the foundation, we can miss it all. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep. With those who weep. I, I think it's surface value. I love this verse. Really, that surface value. What about you? I mean, man, that's that community, right? It's kind of what I just talked about. But he's talking about someone else. He's talking about in hostility. I read this verse and then I read it over and over and over and over and I started thinking about it. I like to rejoice, I like to celebrate. I like to celebrate what God's doing in people's lives. People come to me all the time. Pastor, this is going on, and this is how God came through. Man, I love that. I love looking back at old prayer journals and saying, holy smokes, man, God just came through like no other on this. This is incredible. I love to rejoice. But it says rejoice with those who rejoice. 
weep with those who weep. I've also found myself, and you probably have too, found yourself side by side with someone who's weeping, with someone who's going through. And you put your arm around their shoulder and you say, brother, you say, sister, man, let's pray about this. I feel for you right now. Mm -hmm. And if I'm being totally honest, I think weeping with those who weep is easier because I'm not the one weeping. So I can weep with you. I can love on you. I can pray for you. But let me tell you what I think is hard. I think it's harder to rejoice with those who rejoice. What are you talking about? It's harder to rejoice when I'm busting my butt at work. I'm going for it. I'm going for that promotion. I'm doing everything I can. I'm doing, I'm doing above and beyond. And the other guy comes up to me and says, hey, listen, I got promoted. And you're like, oh, yay. Praise God. Or when you're, I'm not saying you are, or when you're driving, you have a need, you're driving a car that's about to break down, and someone comes up in this brand new truck and goes, man, look what I got. This is awesome, ain't it? And you're like, oh, man, so cool. I'm glad that you can do that. It is hard to rejoice with those who rejoice. Now, there's times when we can rejoice together. That's awesome. But it takes another level, listen, of agape love to say, I'm going to rejoice with you no matter my circumstance. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be glad. I'm going to find pure joy rejoicing with you. And see, here's what I know. And you, you guys have probably encountered people like this. The people, when you surround yourself with people like that, but when you're the one that come up and says, man, I got a promotion, and they are genuinely happy because you have succeeded, those are the people we want to be around, right? Those are the people Paul's telling us to be. Paul's telling us to be the people that it doesn't matter about me. It's not about me. I'm rejoicing with you. I'm weeping for you. That's who we should be. And that's easy, again, inside this body of believers. What about when it's in hostility? You're called to rejoice. With them to rejoice. You're called to weep with them. Weep. Verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Bring a good point here. Verse 15. We just read that, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. What's he talking about here? He's talking about some emotion. He's calling us to sympathize with those who may come at us from a hostile mindset, in a hostile way. He's calling us to sympathize. And then in verse 17, he uses this word harmony. He's calling us to harmonize. He's calling us to sympathize and harmonize. Why? Because this is the, this is the caveat, this is the way that we allow ourselves to love like Christ loved us. That's what this is all about. How do we love how Christ loved us? So instead, in verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Put yourself in a position to where when people can describe you with an adjective, they would say, he is humble. He shows humility. You guys can probably think in your mind right now of people that you say, man, that guy, that lady, she has humility. And everything I've seen in their life shows humility. Humility. They treat others like no other. They truly rejoice with me when I'm happy, when I'm rejoicing. They sat there and wept with me when I'm weeping. They've got this humility. It's not about them. Folks, that's what Paul's saying. Be in that camp. Be someone that someone can look at and say, wow, the humility in that person. That's incredible. Associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Have you ever met someone who's wise by their own estimation? <laughs> you ever met that? Oh, that's annoying, ain't it? <laughs> Come on, let's be real. It's like, oh, okay, Mr. Smarty Pants. This is Smarty Pants. You're wise when it's by your own estimation. He said, listen, don't be that guy. The opposite of that is being humble, right? It, it's, it's stepping back and saying, all right, that, I, I don't know. No, I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to be teachable. I'm willing to be coachable. I'm willing to, to, share, to share my sympathy with you or to harmonize with you. Do not find ourselves to be wise in our own estimations. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Oh, sorry. Well, next verse, 17. Do not repay anyone for, 
uh, anyone evil for evil, give careful thought to what you do. I'll go back there. I'll mention this all up. Verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eye. Well, here's, here's what we know. Here, here's what's ingrained in, in Brian. Someone wrongs me. Can I tell you what the first thing that pops in my head is? And I turn out and choose her to <laughs> Right? Come on. Do you know why that is in the Old Testament? Because here's the reality. When I think of I've arrived two for two, I mean, I, I could mask that with some Christian names, right, for love. If someone were to punch me and knock a tooth out, I'm wanting to punch him and knock all of his teeth out, <laughs> right? If, if someone hurts someone, I, 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 I don't want to hurt them. I want to do something more to them, right? Whatever the case may be. But I for an eye, a tooth for a tooth was there to show people that you've got to control yourself. That's what that's there for. And then here's what Paul's saying. Listen, we're called to not repay any evil for evil. We're called not to do it. Two wrongs don't make a right. You remember that? Mama used to always shout that at my sibling. Well, he did it first. Two wrongs don't make a right. We're not called to repay evil with evil. Instead, here's what we do. We give careful thought. Careful thought. You ever, you ever thought carefully? Careful thought is not driving 73 down to 55. <laughs> careful thought is saying, you know what? The speed limit is 55. I need to check my speed. That's careful thought. It's making a, a choice, making a thought. He says we got to give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Giving careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes makes us stop for just a second and say, if I do this, What's everyone else going to look at me and, and see and think? We're not doing it for them. That's not, the, that's not the, the, the point here. The point is, can I say that how I acted or how I reacted to a situation is honorable? Can I say that? That's important. That's what God has called us to do. Can we act honorably in this case? Verse 18. If possible, I love those two words. We'll talk about that. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. If possible. Can I tell you what Paul said? It may not be possible. But Paul's saying if you have any say, don't let the impossibility of being at peace, don't let the impossibility of of uh, living at peace be on your side of the fence. That's what he's saying. Don't you be the reason that you can't live at peace with someone. We're going to encounter people where whether we like it or not, whether we approach them with grace and mercy and apologize for our wrong, whatever the case may be, we're going to approach people and they're going to look at us and say, I don't care. What you've done is too much. I'm out. I don't want anything. We probably encounter people like that. If we've done everything on our side of the fence, to promote living in peace, we have done right. We have done what God, what Paul is telling us, we should do. So if possible, as far as it depends on us, we should live in peace. And then he transitions. This is the last thing. A couple verses here and we're done. He transitions to the last love. He tells us that we should love among our enemies. Enemies. Who in here says, oh man, I got some enemies? Now, we think like Marvel, right? We're like, oh, Thanos, yeah, he's an enemy, right? But we go to these things, but let me tell you what the definition of enemy is. Actively opposed. That's what Webster Dictionary says. Anyone who's actively opposed. So, I go right back to this thought. If we're sharing the gospel, have we ever met anyone who is actively opposed to what we're saying? By definition, they are an enemy, right? Please don't hear me go out there and just make a bunch of enemies. That's not what I'm saying. But that, by definition, is, is who we are. Listen, here's the reality. We, as believers in Christ, when we evangelize, when we share the gospel, can I tell you what does not happen? We don't get a standing ovation from hell. We don't. That is an enemy. We don't get a standing ovation from those who have cursed Jesus and his name and said he's a false prophet and whatever else garbage they say about our King Jesus. We don't get a standing ovation. We have an enemy. 
Be vocal about your faith, and you'll find enemies. You'll find someone who actively opposes. Now, what do we do with them? He says, friends. Some versions say brothers and sisters. Some say beloved. You can see the heart in this. Paul saying, listen, people I love, do not avenge yourself. Do not avenge yourself. Let me say it a third time. Do not avenge yourself. Man, we need this reminder. Do not avenge yourself. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. God's wrath. Because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. Do we trust that? Do we have hope in that? Because the moment that we attempt to take vengeance into our own hand, we say, God, I don't trust that. The moment we say, you know what, I, I get that you've got vengeance, but you know what, I've got to get mine too. They got me, I've got to get mine. We're saying, God, I can handle the situation better than you can. Listen, I, I heard a, a quote from J.D. Greer one time, and it's changed my, my mind, my perception on vengeance or anything like that. Listen, if someone sins directly against you, brother, sister, sins against you, that sin, the act, not the brother, not the sister, the sin has either been paid for by the blood of Jesus on the cross or will be paid for by that person if they don't know Jesus for all eternity. <coughs> what vengeance can you provide that's greater than that? Can't. In fact, some of us are now saying, man, vengeance is absolutely useful or useless on our end, right? It's, it's all God. Folks, every time someone sins against us, if they sin, guess what? They're a sinner just like me, and that sin was paid for by the, by the blood of Jesus on the cross. Amen? It's taken care of. And you know what? Heaven forbid they don't know King Jesus, they're going to pay for that sin for all eternity. I have no place even thinking that I have a role in vengeance. He gives us an example. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Now, there's an old Egyptian tradition that what they would do is if, if they felt shame, if they wronged somebody, if they wanted to really show someone they're sorry, they would take a little towel and put it on their head, and they'd take a little pan and put hot coals on it, and they'd put it on their head, and they would walk out in public. And here's what it says, man, I'm so shameful for you see someone walk around with a pain on their head and cold, you're going to be like, whoa. That took a lot for you to do that. But publicly saying, man, I'm so ashamed of what I did. Here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying when you have an enemy, they wrong you, instead of showing vengeance, you show them love. You meet their needs. You feed them. You If they're hungry, you give them a drink if they're thirsty. What you're doing is actually putting them to shame. You're killing them with kindness. You guys heard that before, right? You're saying, I'm going to be the bigger man. I'm going to be the bigger woman. I'm going to step in here and say, you know what? I'm going to love like Christ has told me to love inside this church, in hostility, and I'm going to love my enemies. I'm not going to repay evil with evil. I'm not going to seek vengeance. Instead, I'm going to show the love of Jesus. I'm going to show the love of Jesus to this person. See, here's the truth. Listen, this is good. This one's free. Our love for others should be independent of our treatment. You guys hear that? Our love for others should be independent of our treatment. How people treat us should determine how we love them. Why? Because we know that through the Holy Spirit, Jesus fills us with his love to, to, to the brim, to more. It overflows more than we can. And can I tell you something? If we're found in Christ Jesus, that pouring of the love, it never stops. So we always have the means to pour that love right back out, no matter how they're treated. It doesn't matter. But you don't know how they treated me. I can still love them. Now, have it. I'm not saying that you have to stay in a relationship that is toxic. I'm not talking about boy girl, I'm just talking about amongst people. We are called to be wise and who we surround ourselves. We're called to associate with the humble. So I'm not saying we take that and say, I'm going to keep loving you even though that you did wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong. We have to stand up for ourselves, absolutely. But we should continue 
and love others regardless of our treatment. And I love verse 21. In fact, maybe my favorite in all this, because he sums up everything he just said. Listen, do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. All the negative stuff that we just talked about, that's evil. That's apart from God. That's separate than God. Instead, conquer evil with good. Remember that definition. Useful, pleasant, honorable. That's what should flow out of us. We don't just, we don't just like handle or endure evil. We conquer evil with good. Why? Because Jesus has conquered evil once and for all because of his goodness. So I pose a question to you. Christian, follower of Jesus, does this love describe you? Does this love describe us? Does this love describe us inside the church? I would say a lot of us would say, actually, that, that describes us right there. That's an easy one. Does this describe us facing hostility? When people are just hostile, when it's just, maybe not even an enemy, it's just, man, I, I don't know. Does this describe us when we're facing those enemies? When we are facing persecution? Does this describe us? Because Paul says this, if you're a believer, this is what you're commanded to do. In fact, in John 13, 35, they will know you. As disciples, for the money because they're in love. Jesus told the ones that were closest to him, the reason that the world around you will know that you're disciples of King Jesus is because of how you love others. Folks, that's power. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes, bow your head, and close. At face value, this is easy. We can say, yeah, we're a loving person. This is easy to love people. It's not easy to love people in the church. It's, yeah, I've got this, Pastor Brian. But what about when it's tough? Can we sit there? I don't know. You, you don't know an answer to me. You don't know an answer to your Savior, to King Jesus. In fact, while we're speaking of love, the only reason we know what love is is because Christ loved us first. So if you're in here right now and you say, I know that I'm a born again believer of King Jesus. I know that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, it dwells within me. That I'm powered by the Holy Spirit. That I'm filled up with love by the Holy Spirit. Here's what I pray. I pray that we pray a prayer much like David did in Psalm 139. He says, God, Lord, search me, know me, try me. Show me every place in my heart before I have failed. And then lead me in the everlasting way. See, David didn't call, didn't come before God and fall on his face and say, I'll never do that again. I'll never not love someone. I'll never repay evil. He didn't say that. Instead, he said, God, you know me better than I know myself. I need you to search me, to try me, to show me, and then to lead me. Folks, are we being led by the Holy Spirit? if we are, we're going to look a whole lot like this person that Paul describes. Maybe we're in here today and we don't even know Jesus as our Savior. Can I tell you something? That's where the love starts. That's where the love starts. Because Jesus Christ himself walked this earth for 33 years. Out of love for us, he gave himself up on a cross. He was buried for three days. He rose again. We're going to celebrate in a couple weeks on cross. Celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. He walked the earth for 40 days, witnessed by over 500 people before he ascended into heaven. To do what? To continue loving us by interceding on behalf of us to the Father. Folks, Jesus loves you. And if you don't know his love, I pray that today be the day you surrender to him. Father, we come to you this morning thankful for your love for us, thankful for these words. I'm thankful that in 13 verses, Apostle Paul crammed 30 commands and exhortations in there. Father, there's so much practical information. It's like drinking out of a fire hydrant. Father, I pray right now that our lives would look a whole lot like those verses. 
I pray for anyone in this room right now who, who, who can read a verse and say, man, I'm struggling. I'm falling short with that. That, Father, we would cling to you. That we would be persistent in prayer. That, Father, we would be called to love you like you love us. A God that love. Father, I pray for anyone in this room who may not know you. That, God, today would be the day they surrender their lives to you. Father, let us, let us be a people that we can be fired up, that we can burn with desire while we're in here singing worship songs and reading your Bible. But Father, that passion continues as we walk out these doors and we can't tell somebody about you. Father, as we continue worshiping you through song, we pray your glory, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.